Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Late winter is the best time to prune fruit trees. Today we're going to show you how to prune apple trees. Also, lettuce is a great cool season vegetable. Today we're going to talk about how to grow it. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mike Dennison. Mr. D is a retired Extension Director, and Tom Mishore will be joining us later to talk about lettuce. Look, Mr. D, we are here, we're about to prune an apple tree, but before we do that, we definitely want to thank the good folks at Jones Orchard, specifically Mr. Henry Jones for allowing us to be out here today so Got you can to, prune one of these apple trees for them. Uh, we prune apples in pairs the same way. Uh, we, we, we prune them to a central, a strong central leader. Uh, this apple tree has, has, has a really good start. Under ideal conditions, uh, we will have a uh, whirl of limbs at about 18 to 20 inches from the ground. Uh, four limbs evenly spaced around the trunk of the tree. Uh, as we know in the real world, <laughs> ideal conditions doesn't exist all the time. That's this right. one has, uh, it's, we've got one, two, three, four limbs right here. Um, I'm gonna, because these two limbs are sharing the sun, I'm gonna take this one off right here and so, so I've got three scaffold limbs on my bottom layer, uh, which, which is okay. Uh, now I'm gonna come on up this tree. Ideally, I would have 18 to 20 inches before I get to the next whirl of limbs. So I'm going to, uh, these are a little close to this row of scaffolds. This one especially is a little close. Okay. So I'm gonna take it off and I'm gonna leave about a wow. quarter inch. I don't wanna get too close to the trunk. I wanna leave enough room for that to heal. Uh, let's see, uh, these limbs are sharing the same, this limb is right above this limb, so I, I don't need that to happen, and I'm going to take this one off right here. So now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six scaffold limbs. It's probably a little much, but I'm going to go ahead and leave that. Now I'm going to take everything else off. Again, I'm going to try to leave a space, ideally of 18 to 20 inches. I don't quite have that here. Taking all this off so I don't want anything to grow between here and here. Okay. And I'm going to leave these buds yeah, and, wow. and, and you know you'll have eventually limbs come out where these buds are right. and they will fill this void over here. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's pretty well got the scaffold limbs chosen. Now apples and especially pears everything wants to be the central leader yeah. but i'm going to teach this tree now we only have one central leader so this this is trying to be the central leader here so i'm going to take it off All right and then and then i have limbs crossing and that's not good so this limb is invading this scaffold limb space so i'm going to take it off again leaving about a quarter inch uh, so that it'll have plenty of room to heal mm -hmm. so that uh has got uh, that taken care of. It's looking pretty good. Now I'm, I'm gonna go to all of these limbs. Okay, I don't want anything to grow back up toward the center of the tree, so I'm gonna take that off. Uh, then I'm gonna go to the tips of all of these limbs and I'm gonna take off about a third of last year's growth or you know, six to 12 inches or something like that is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, uh, rule of thumb. It's called heading back. Yeah. And, when you, and this is a very important cut because when you head back apples and pears, you want to make a cut above a bud that's growing, the bud that's pointing in the direction that you want the limb to grow. And you want the limb to grow out away from the tree. If you cut, make your cut above a bud that's growing back toward the tree, that's, that limb will come out and it'll be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of going back toward the center of the tree, which is not good. So is that a 45 degree cut or? It's just, it doesn't, it's just, it's just cut it okay, off. I'm going to cut it okay. off straight. Uh, this one, this bud is, is headed away from right. the tree, so I'm going to cut right above that bud, about a quarter of an inch above that bud, okay. and then I'm going to do that with all of these lower scaffolds. I'm, I can tell where 
last year's growth was. So that one's going in the right direction. I'm going to go on up to this scaffold since I'm standing here. Same thing, picking a bud that's growing away from the tree. There's an ease on around here. On every limb, I'm going to head it back. To a bud that's going in the directions I want it to go. Oh yeah. Okay, this limb is going straight up, trying to be the central leader, so I'm going to cut it above that limb right there. Okay, easing around. Just easing up the tree. This limb would really like to be the central leader, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do a, some severe it's got uh, to go, construction eh? to it <laughs> and do that. Wow. And we got that in pretty good shape now. That Looks that good. apple tree is in, in is 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 pretty much ready to go. It's gonna have a flush of growth now because uh, anytime you prune a tree this time of the year, this is the best time of the year. You know, the middle of uh, March is the best time to do any pruning. And when you prune limbs off, you've got a root system that's fully developed and it's gonna compensate by giving you a flush of growth and the growth is gonna go in the direction that you want it to go. The, the reason we do this is to, uh, to, to kind of open the tree up where uh, you can do a really good job of spraying your fungicides and mm. insecticides so you get better coverage if you open the tree up a little bit. You're also thinning some of the fruit off. Most of these uh, fruit trees will, uh, will have 80% more fruit than they can actually set. So we're taking some of the fruit off now. We're going to have to do some thinning also as we get, uh, probably, unless Mother Nature comes in with, <laughs> with a good heavy frost right. and, and, and helps us do a little thinning. But uh, hopefully we're going to have to do some thinning on these, on these fruit trees. Okay. And okay. this is what, a three-year-old tree? Uh, that's, I'd yeah. say that's about right. Yeah, mm -hmm. A three-year-old tree. Arkansas black. Good, good variety. Good variety. Good apple. All right, well, I'm sure Mr. Henry would appreciate that nice pruning job you did on this apple tree there. I hope so. <laughs> sometimes folks get a little nervous. It's like a bad haircut sometimes. <laughs> folks get a little nervous. Well, I think this is a good one. Appreciate <laughs> that demonstration, Mr. D. That's welcome. All right. Hybrid. Hybrid. Oh, hybrid. yeah, yeah. That's those cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> The new, yeah. yeah, the new hybrid cars. <laughs> the new hybrid cars, yeah. Okay, next one. <laughs> yeah, hybrids can get a little bit yeah, sticky little because in, in plants, a hybrid is something that we have manipulated. Okay. It's not something that typically we term as occurring in nature, although they do. Plants cross-pollinate between, you know, different species all the time. Sure. But a hybrid is something that's usually done by scientists to cross two different varieties of, say, tomatoes to get a better plant. Okay. Typically, it would be to get those traits that would make it a better product, a better tomato, more disease resistance, yeah, okay. you know, things like mm -hmm. that. So a hybrid is a plant that is a cross between two different parents. And a lot of times that if you save the seed from a hybrid, which is questions, we get those too, mm -hmm. right, Chris? Yes, we do. They we sure sometimes do. will not breed true because right. they're from two different lines. Right. And then that plant sets seed. Well, obviously, it was pollinated from something else, so you're not really going to get that hybrid plant. So the only way you'd get another hybrid plant was to go back to the original cross, cross again, mm. wow. you know, and get the hybrid plant that way. Or you can, you know, like a tomato, you could, you know, clone it, take a cutting. You know, we talked about, we talked about taking that, right? the suckers mm -hmm. from tomato yeah, plants. Yeah, right. I mean, that would, that's a clone. Mm -hmm. So that's the same as the parent, but that's usually what hybrids are, something that we have manipulated through genetic breeding, you know, to mm -hmm. establish a, a new plant that has good characteristics of both parents. All right, we have Tipton County Master Gardener, Mr. Thomas Sewer here today to tell us a little bit about growing lettuce. So where do you want to get started? Well, I thought about talking about the common types of lettuce that you see. Uh, we have the iceberg lettuce, which is also uh, referred to as head lettuce. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, when I was a kid growing up in my dad's grocery store, that's what we called it, head lettuce. Uh, the term iceberg was actually set up or developed by the uh, train, the railroad companies, that they had, when they first started shipping them to the East Coast, uh, this is before they had refrigerated trains, 
uh, they would have to put piles of piles of crushed ice hmm. to make sure that they make it all the way to the East Coast. And the people who work for the railroads start calling them icebergs because they look like icebergs in there and the name stuck. So how about that? that's how the name iceberg came about. It had okay. nothing to do with the lettuce. So you, uh, you hear the term head lettuce or iceberg lettuce, it's the same thing. Another common type, by the way, this is my favorite. Okay. My wife's favorite is the romaine lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and romaine, I've grown that here, and it grows really well, uh, has basically no disease or bug problems. And it's also a little bit slower to boat. Okay. And then we also have the uh, leaf lettuce. Uh, this is, I'm not sure what type of variety this is, but there are several varieties of that. There's the uh, black seeded symptom, the butter crunch, and a, f a few other types. Okay. Bib lettuce is another one, and of course the romaine. The romaine is actually called Paris Island Cos, C-O-S. Uh, there's also what they call the giant uh, variety that is part of the romaine family, but it produces huge leaves. So you can actually, for people on a diet, wrap it up and make burritos out of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> when to plant. Uh, it is a cool season plant. Matter of fact, I yeah. tell people, anytime I'm giving a presentation on <laughs> vegetables, I, was, I say there are cool season vegetables yeah. and warm, warm season, season vegetables. Right. <laughs> you don't see anything listed as cold season or hot season. Some plants will tolerate it to a certain degree, but they don't like it, just like your pansies. Right. But uh, since it is a cool season plant and our cool se season is very short, you really need to start it indoors. Uh, they will tolerate some frost, they will not tolerate uh, hard freezes. So if you start them indoors, uh, six weeks before you start planting them, you need to move them outside or usually within uh, a week or two before the last frost date, uh, they should be okay. Um, also, it's uh, one you can also plant in the fall, uh, but again, in the fall, or excuse me, late summer, July, July and August, but you have to start them inside. Uh, lettuce seeds will not germinate above 75 degrees. Okay. So they just cannot tolerate the heat. And uh, they're also will wilt quickly in, in the summertime. So uh, you got to try to make maximum use of the cool, cool season both days. Um, it does not transplant well. Uh, but if you are going to try to grow them, you need to grow them in at least the uh, three inch containers. Okay. So when you do transplant it, the roots are still contained within that and it'll be less transplant shock. Okay. Makes sense. Let's see. Uh, also, one thing about lettuce, unless you're a rabbit, <laughs> uh, you cannot probably eat all the lettuce that you can grow. So I hope you have a, a lot of friends and family that may want it. Uh, otherwise, it's like I said, they, they grow so quickly and, and the seeds are so small. Yeah, they are small, my goodness. That uh, it's, you can't plant them very deep, which mm -hmm. means that you gotta keep it constantly moist. Mm -hmm. You can't let it dry out because the seeds are so close to the surface. And as we know, it's a surface that's gonna dry out first. Sure. And, uh, so you can start indoors and uh, and pretty much that it, uh, at longest time I said, you, you know, we couldn't grow this here, but you can. If you start off, uh, like I said, early enough in the spring inside and in July uh, and August so that they're about ready to go off when the September temperatures start dropping, which is usually mid-September, somewhere in that nature. Uh, I got uh, a grow stand with four fluorescent lights on it. Okay. And I'm going to just see if I can grow them in the house wow. before I put them outside, see how big I can get them. But uh, again, uh, the romaine, like I said, it's pretty much easier to grow and it will tolerate a little bit more heat. But as soon as it starts getting hot, those, uh, yeah. because there's like 95% water, right. they're, they're going to just wilt. Just like me on 110 the other day. <laughs> it's like any of us. Mm -hmm. And there's, like I said, these are the, the three biggies. As to what type of leaf lettuce this is, I have no idea. Okay. It's just, but it's a biggie because that's just one plant. Right. And I don't know if it was grown. And by the way, uh, I didn't mention that on the iceberg lettuce, uh, approximately 75% of it comes from the Salinas Valley of California. 
uh, where because of the breeze and cooler temperatures coming off the ocean, it's not that far from the ocean, it maintains a kind of cool situation. Then in the evening, the sun goes down, uh, especially if it's low humidity, which it is, the temperature drops pretty good because there's no moisture in the air to hold the temperature up. Okay. So it has a pretty much constant temperature uh, every day, night, day, and throughout the year. So that's, like I said, that's where the biggest... Uh, oh, this is perfect you know. conditions for the most part. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Tom, quickly, uh, so no disease problems you've encountered or any pests? Not, not, not really. Uh, on the uh, lettuce, like I said, on the romaine lettuce, definitely not. Okay. I have no problems with it. Uh, since I haven't really grown that much of the other lettuce, especially I haven't grown the iceberg or head lettuce, uh, I'm not really sure okay. about bug problems on it. I do know it's wilt and the leaves turning brown and things of that nature. But as far as uh, bugs go, I, with the few that I've grown, I've not really had any much problem, just, just the heat. And rabbits. And, and, and rabbits. rabbits, yeah. Right. Now rabbits, you know, they, they might appreciate you growing a lot more than you do. Hmm. But uh, fortunately, I got a fence around my yard, so I don't have any problems. I had rabbits one time. Boy, it was tasty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, quickly too, um, how do you know when they get ready to bolt? Uh, it'll start forming a, a, a center stem right in the middle, yeah. and that's when. And when it, and even when it bolts, they're still edible. Okay. Just like if you do grow a bunch of it, and you have to thin them out. Matter of fact, the hardest thing I think about growing it, besides the heat, is getting those seeds spaced, because you, you, there's a tendency to just overlap the seeds. Sure. But the nice thing about the lettuce, uh, unlike a lot of plants, uh, the seedlings you got to thin out are edible. Okay. So they are edible. Mm -hmm. All right, we appreciate that information about lettuce there, Mr. Tom. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, obviously we didn't get a chance to clean our, our raised bed last year, so now's the time to do that before we plant this spring crop. Uh, one thing that we need to do is get rid of these cauliflower. Now, we want to make sure we shake that good soil back off in there, and that can go in the compost pile. Uh, all these leaves and things will just compost down and be good stuff for us next year. Now, also, here with the tomatoes, due to the blight issues, we do not want them around. So, we want to put this in the trash. Uh, because that's all we'll be doing is reintroducing that back into our beds next year. Uh, so always remember to clean your garden out. That way it gives you a good fresh start for the next year. All right, here's our Q&A session. Mr. Tom, you jump in there and help us out, okay? All right. Here's our first email. I had a problem with something eating my cabbage last year. How can I control them for this year? So Mr. D, what do you think was probably eating the cabbage from last year? Could have been several things, but it was probably, probably. <laughs> uh, either a cabbage looper <laughs> or an imported cabbage worm. Mm -hmm. And if it was a cabbage looper, uh, I would uh, use Bacillus thuringiensis, mm -hmm. Dipel, Javelin, or one of the other products that has the BT in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got to start early. If you wait until you see the big holes in the leaves, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know the damage was done a long time ago. That's right. Um, and the, the little critters are hard to see. They're really, they camouflage really well. Uh, if it's an imported, and, and it's easy to tell the difference. Uh, the cabbage looper has got two pair of pro legs and, and it does the loopity loop when yeah. it walks. And uh, the imported cabbage worm has four pairs of pro legs and it uh, can crawl, you know, uh -huh. it doesn't move around. It's not near, it doesn't move around as much as the looper does anyway. But uh, it has four pairs of pro legs, so it's easy to identify. Unfortunately, the BT doesn't work as well on the imported cabbage worm as it uh, does on the looper. So if you have the imported cabbage worm, permethrin, esfenvalerate, or spinosad hmm. would be a little better choice to use. Hmm. Follow the label directions as follow always. The label. Hmm. And I'll tell you what, if you can uh, just follow their uh, excrements, mm -hmm. you'll see what they are because they leave behind a mess. That's yeah. right, they do leave behind a mess. <laughs> now, do we have pictures? We didn't have pictures. Could have been rabbits or groundhogs too. I mean, yeah. they like. Yeah, we didn't have too. pictures of that. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm assuming uh, if it's a cabbage problem, about 99% of the time, I, flea beetles will even get on them. But but most of the time with cabbage, it's one of the two worms. Yeah, I would agree. Mr. Tom, anything to add to that? No. Uh, he 
covered everything I was going to say. The only thing <laughs> is that uh, I would add is the, uh, the little white butterflies, are they the ones that causes that? That's what does, that, causes the imported cabbage yeah. worm. So if you see this little pretty little, pretty thing is pretty. you've ever seen, mm -hmm. little cute little white butterflies, and, and they'll fly from plant to plant. And you think they're just sitting there enjoying the aroma. <laughs> what, they're, what they're doing is laying eggs. They're laying eggs, and, and they're pretty little butterflies, but that's the imported cabbage worm. Yeah. So you better look out. And only one thing, too, I'll also add is that BT, it's uh, approved for organic control. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's right. It's safe for animals, birds, birds, pets, and everything else. That's right. And even conventional gardeners uses it. That's right. Safe product. Mm -hmm. Perfectly safe and natural. Yep. All right. It doesn't hurt the beneficials. That's right. All right, so here's our next question. And we do have a picture for this one, Mr. D. I have lots of these bugs on my Japanese maple tree. What are they and can I get rid of them? The Japanese maple scale, isn't it? Those Japanese maple scales. That's a, that's you would be that's correct. That's exactly what that is. I was hoping that's what it was. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. And it's a lot of them, too. Did yeah, you see that? Yeah, they covered up. I, I, I did see the picture. Wow. And. Uh, Dormant oil is about the only thing we can recommend right now, and this, yeah. that's what that's what's uh, recommended February, March, and February, and, March. And uh, then uh, you can go with the, the horticultural oil. You can actually use a heavier dose of horticultural oil right now instead of dormant oil. Instead of the dormant oil, you sure could. And then uh, then later on, for sure, the horticultural oil mm -hmm. later on in the year. You can do that, and then you can also use uh, Safari, which is one of the uh, systemic soil drenches, if you want to go that route. Right. Uh, safari actually is uh, dino tefaran, gets into the uh, vascular tissue pretty quick uh, and it will suppress the scales. But that's... That's good to know. Yeah, it's pretty good infestation yeah, I there. see Tristar, Distance, and Talus. Is that the same active as in the uh, Safari or is that a different active ingredient? It's a different active ingredient. Different. But they are pretty good, you know, all systemic. Mm -hmm. Right, just different active okay. ingredient. Okay, uh, I see they're, some, on, they're on our yeah, they are, the red book. Okay, in the red book. Okay, okay. And, and something else I know too from, um, you know, um, I remember seeing this last year and talking to uh, Dr. Hill, you know, Dr. Hill, mm -hmm. uh, extension etymologist, and he was saying if you just get out a, a soft brush and dip it in some uh, soapy water, you can actually scrub them off. And a lot of and then Japanese he said, maple small right, enough you can do that. They're, they're small enough, you actually scrub them off, and then he would come, he said, come behind that with a you know, jet stream of water and just knock them off. Yep. Physically remove them. Physically remove them. Yeah. That'll work. Yeah, but that was a lot, you know, that he had on his Japanese maples for sure. And then if you look, the oyster shaped ones are the females. Oh. I learned that from Dr. Hill too. And they the slender look. ones are the males. And the slender ones are the males. Yeah. You know, yeah. But the oyster. The females look just like a little oyster if you just look at them real closely. You know, on a scale is the same, yeah, way. Same, way. the same way. Well, you know what? Japanese maple scales mm -hmm. are armored scales. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to produce the honeydew. Right. Right. But yeah, you, you, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Just like you run them a scale. Mm -hmm. All right. So I hope that helps you out. So here's our next question Is it too late to start my cool season vegetables? Uh, lettuce, cabbage specifically, Mr. Tom. What do you think about that? Is it too late? Because now we're looking at to April. Mm -hmm. um, can we go into April? Is that yeah, too you late? You can or? if you're starting off with plants. Starting off with plants. Okay. Yeah, for example, if you go uh, and buy your plants uh, or you're going to start with seeds, you typically want to start your plants indoors, like anything part of the coal family, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, you want them to start them six weeks before the uh, end of, of frost and get them into the garden. If you're talking about starting from seeds right now, yeah. Because their cool season, like I said, is so short mm -hmm. that you want to take maximum use of starting your plants indoors so you can start off with plants. But uh, as far as cabbage goes, uh, matter of fact, they're available right now, all the plants okay. for, for cabbage, broccoli, uh, cauliflower. I try growing um, Brussels sprouts but Brussels sprouts require an extremely long, cool season. So I never had any luck growing it here. In California, I did, not here. Yeah, but not here. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, you know, for most of your homeowners, they're, they're probably going to go out and buy transplants anyway. Yeah. You know, they can go to your big box stores and, mm -hmm. you know, get what's available and put those in the ground, you know. And, right. and if under that situation, yeah, they can put them in. Okay. Because they will take a little bit of heat. Let us know. But your broccoli, cabbage, and those members, yeah, they'll take some heat. Uh, Matter of fact, the ones I planted, they're already beginning to hit up. But I got a bunch of small ones still ready to grow. Okay. 
Mr. D, you want something to add to that? I was just going to say, according to the, the UT's uh, guide to spring planted cool season <laughs> vegetables, you know, that, that you've got at your mm -hmm. office, we have it off. local extension office, there's several things that, that goes into March, and I, I, you, what you said is true about the cabbage and lettuce and all that, but, the, you know, you got English peas that you can still plant oh, yeah. and onions yeah. and, and uh, uh, radishes. And mm. you know things like that. Uh, you still got time to to do that. Yeah, matter of fact, I uh, got three different varieties of onions growing in my garden right now, and uh, broccoli and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. you can plant them in February. Mm -hmm. It'd be good to go. Yeah. All right, Mr. Tom, Mr. D, we out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. Want to get more information on something you saw on today's show? Go to familyplotgarden.com. We have extension publications on every topic we talk about. You can print them and take them with you into your garden. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.